Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute, is brought to you by the members of the John Adams. Why not become a member yourself, or even better, a patron, and enjoy all the extras and benefits? Find out more at john-adams.nl, john-adams.nl, and click on Become a Member. From Amsterdam, this is Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute, a treasure trove of the best and the brightest of American thinking. Question, how would you feel if Vladimir Putin offered to trade 12 spies to Donald Trump in exchange for just you? That is exactly what happened to Bill Browder. The obvious question for me and for everybody else was, what was Donald Trump going to say? And that question then came up pretty quickly afterwards when another journalist said, well, Mr. President, what do you think about this idea of handing Bill Browder over? And he said, I think it's an incredible offer. <laughs> Luckily for Bill Browder, that offer was voted down by Congress. Mr. Browder recently told me that until the war in Ukraine, he believed he was Vladimir Putin's enemy number one. And this is why... Between 1996 and 2005, Bill Browder ran the largest foreign investment firm in Russia until he was declared a threat to Russian national security and got kicked out of the country. Browder spent the last 14 years trying to understand the dark money flowing out of Russia, and he wrote about it in his most recent book, Freezing Order. This is the story of Browder's quest to establish a global regime for imposing sanctions on Russians involved in corruption and criminality. This resulted in the Magnitsky Act, named after Browder's lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, who was arrested, tortured, and died in Russian police custody. Freezing Order is a true story, but it reads like an international spy thriller that sheds light on the tactics of modern autocracies. Bill spoke to our Amsterdam audience in May of 2022 about why he wrote Freezing Order and was then interviewed by the Dutch journalist and Russia expert, Michel Krilars. So here's Bill Browder. So I started writing this book uh, in July of 2018. I was uh, determined to write this book. This was my second book. I wrote another book that probably some of you have read called Red Notice. And Red Notice was all about my time trying to get the um, Magnitsky Act passed and the murder of Sergei Magnitsky. But so much stuff had happened between 2012 when the Magnitsky Act was passed and 2018, so much crazy stuff. I felt it was really uh, absolutely essential that I, I write this book and uh, tell this story. So I, um, I was in Aspen, Colorado at the time. It's one of my favorite places to go. And um, uh, I was with my family, and, and, I, uh, and I'm normally somebody who's always checking my phone and looking on Twitter and watching the news. And I, I, I said to myself, I have to write this book. And I put my phone down, face down, and I made a vow to myself that I'm just going to work for like three or four hours and just start writing because it's just so important to get this book written. So I put the phone down, and I spent an hour struggling to get like 50 words on paper, and it just wasn't coming out. And, uh, and I finally couldn't um, take it anymore, so I grabbed my phone and turned it over. And there were like... 150 messages on my phone. And um, the first message saying, are you watching Helsinki? Um, and the second message said, what the F? And it turned out that um, while I was writing, uh, trying to write my book, um, there was a meeting going on between um, Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin in Helsinki. This was the Helsinki summit. And the Helsinki summit uh, was uh, taking place on a Monday. And on the previous Friday, the uh, special counsel, Robert Mueller, the person whose job it was to investigate um, Russian collusion and interference in the US political process, he had indicted 12 Russian military intelligence officers. And 
the obvious question, so this was on the Friday before the summit, and so the obvious question surely was gonna come up about what was gonna happen. So Putin and Trump go into a secret meeting, um, no staff, no witnesses, only the two of them plus Putin's translator attended. They spent three or four hours in this meeting. They come out into a press conference. Trump has kind of got his head down, Putin is strutting like he owns the place. And they stand up at their respective podiums and questions start. And several questions in, a Reuters journalist raises his hand, asks Putin, um, are you gonna hand over those 12 uh, Russian GRU officers? And Putin had obviously been preparing for this question all weekend and he smiled very smugly. And he said, you know, probably yes, uh, but we would expect some reciprocity in this case. And if we were to provide these 12 uh, GRU officers, we would expect uh, Donald Trump to hand over Bill Browder. <laughs> so, I, 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 I had, after getting all these messages on my phone, I had, I had gotten the um, playback so I could, I could watch this uh, press conference. And I hear my name being muttered by the uh, president of Russia was pretty alarming, but it wasn't that alarming because it wasn't the first time uh, he had said things about me in public. But the obvious question for me and for everybody else was, uh, what was Donald Trump going to say? And that question then came up pretty quickly afterwards when another journalist said, well, Mr. President, what do you think about this idea of handing Bill Browder over? And he said, I think it's an incredible offer. <laughs> now that really did shock me. <laughs> to have the most powerful man in the free world um, agree to hand me over uh, to Vladimir Putin. And if I had been handed over, um, I would have been killed in Moscow. And so I would have expected within minutes after the summit ended that, that the um, aides to Donald Trump would have uh, said, that, you know, you have to walk that back. But no, total silence. Um, and then the next morning, uh, to add some fuel to the fire, the Russians decided to add 11 more people they wanted handed over. If, if the Americans wanted 12, they didn't want to just have one, they wanted 12. And they asked for Mike McFall, who is the US ambassador to Russia. They asked for a guy named Kyle Parker, who was a person who uh, worked very closely with me in writing the Magnitsky Act, and, and uh, a whole bunch of other people all connected to me and my campaign for justice for Sergei Magnitsky. And, uh, uh, and still silence from Donald Trump. And so about three days into this, uh, I'm, uh, and of course the whole world wants to know who is Bill Browder at this point because no one, you know, not, not too many people knew who Bill Browder was. And so I was on a interview with Fox News um, explaining this thing. And um, uh, I was about to launch into something and they said, uh, you know, hold, hold, hold on Mr. Browder, we're gonna go into a, um, a live, briefing at the White House um, press room. And uh, uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who was the um, press secretary at the time, was then asked by the New York Times uh, journalist, so you know, what's gonna happen? Are you gonna hand over Bill Browder, Mike McFaul, and all the others? And uh, this was three days after the summit. And she said, well, the president still is consulting with his staff and he's still considering it. And I, I, and I, 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 am, I, I pictured that, that I was gonna be snatched up by the Department of Homeland Security, bundled into an airplane and, and rendered back to Moscow. And it was only on the fourth day that the Senate then began to, um, uh, they, ha they were gonna have a vote on whether we should be handed over or not. And um, it was pretty obvious which way the, the wind was blowing as far as the Senate was concerned, and there was no di difference between the Democrats and Republicans. And um, about a half hour before the vote, and the vote was gonna be 98 to zero, um, half hour before the vote, uh, Donald Trump meekly said through his spokesperson, 
Uh, she said, the president has considered this uh, and he understands how genuine the desire was by Vladimir Putin, but he's not gonna honor it at this point. And then of course the Senate voted 98 to zero not to hand us over. Um, but this is the, um, unfortunately this is the, the kind of life that I've been living uh, since, uh, uh, since the Magnitsky Act was passed. And uh, it was kind of crazy why Putin was so desperate to have me handed over. Um, and I should also point out that Putin almost never uh, mentions the name of his enemies. He doesn't actually mention the name Alexei Navalny. Uh, he never mentioned the name Boris Nemtsov. Uh, he, he almost never mentions the name of any enemy, but the fact that he had mentioned my name was so significant because I had gotten him so rattled because of the Magnitsky Act. Now, why did Putin care so much about the Magnitsky Act? And this is what my book is about. And this is also, I think, what this war is about in Ukraine. And the reason that Putin cares so much about the Magnitsky Act, and I've discovered this and, and, and researched it and have proven it, is that um, between the year 2000, when Putin came to power, and 2022, now, Putin and about a thousand people around him in the government have stolen a trillion dollars from the Russian people. That's a thousand billion dollars. That's just, it's just an unbelievably large amount of money. And that money has been kept not inside Russia. That money has been kept in the West, in real estate, in the south of France, in uh, yachts parked off the, Co the Côte d'Azur, and private jets, and Swiss bank accounts, and boarding schools for their children, and, and all of these different things. And that they have, that's been the whole basis for the Putin regime. You, you go into government not to serve the people, you go into government to steal money, and the higher you are in government, the more money you steal. And by Passing the Magnitsky Act, getting the Magnitsky Act passed, which was named after my lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, who Michelle just talked to you about, um, that freezes the assets and bans the visas of Russian human rights violators and kleptocrats, and human rights violators and kleptocrats all over the world. And Putin felt like his entire raison d'etre was basically put at risk by the Magnitsky Act. And the Magnitsky Act doesn't just exist in, in the United States. We got it passed in the United States in 2012. Um, but it now exists in 34 countries, in all 27 countries of the European Union, in UK, Canada, Australia, Norway, Montenegro, Kosovo, all sorts of, all sorts of places, and many more places uh, to have it. And so Putin, understood in 2017 and 2015 back as 2012 that one day he was going to do something so terrible that they were going to go after his money in the West. And um, he, he knew in advance he was going to do something like what he's done very recently. And I would argue that the reason why Putin has gone to war um, has nothing to do with NATO, uh, has nothing to do with the Russian Empire reestablishing the Russian Empire, and nothing to do with the Ukraine wanting to join the European Union. It has to do with this trillion dollars that should have been spent on hospitals, schools, roads, etc. And after 22 years of stealing from the Russian people, you know they say he had a high approval rating, but I've seen people with high approval ratings get wiped out in a weekend when the price of gas goes up or something like that. In fact, the same exact thing happened in Kazakhstan in January this year. Their dictator got taken out in like a matter of days when they raised the price of gas. And I think Putin was genuinely, genuinely afraid that one day, at, a, at some point, without warning, the Russian people would say enough is enough. How, how could we have allowed this to happen and gone after him? And what does a dictator do in a situation like that. Uh, a dictator says, I don't want the people mad at me, I want them mad at somebody else. 
and so they start a war. And that's what I think this war is about in Ukraine, is about distracting the Russian people. <clears throat> and Putin has achieved his objective, his approval ratings and, and the level of hysteria, of sort of positive hysteria surrounding him puts him in good stead to stay in power for a long time, and so he's succeeded. Um, the only thing that he didn't succeed in is um, protecting his money abroad, because the death of Sergei Magnitsky and the Magnitsky Act and the uh, template which is created has now been used to seize all sorts of his assets around the world. But in his mind, um, staying in power and staying alive is probably more important than anything, and, and that's, that's kind of why he's at this war. Thank you. And with that, the Dutch journalist Michel Krierlars took to the stage and asked Bill Browder about just how to track corruption. Where does the money go? How does it get out? Who gets it? Turns out that in Russia, you can find out almost anything if you know where to go, such as the Gorbushka information market. And you can literally buy any information you want at Gorbushka or one of its offshoots. So if I want to get your bank information, I want to know what you've been doing with your bank account, I can get your bank information. It's easy like that. If I want to find out where you've traveled to, no problem. Mobile phone data, easy. Um, and so, I mean, it's kind of disturbing if, you, if you're living in Russia because everything is available. But if you're investigating criminal activity, it's pretty exciting. What, what were you looking for from the start? Because some of your legal advisors told you to go to, to, to this market to buy this information. From that on, you knew where to find where the money went to. So, so we wanted to know, Sergei Magnitsky was murdered because he uncovered a $230 million government corruption scheme. And I wanted to know who got that $230 million so that we could make sure that they don't enjoy it and they have it taken away from them. And, um, and so we then started to buy databases which would tell us where, where the money went. And it wasn't just Gorbushka where we got the money, and we got the um, information. There's something else that's interesting about tracking money, which I learned. Um, I didn't know anything about this before I started this campaign, uh, which is that anytime a dollar is transferred anywhere in the world, um, from, even from one Russian bank to another Russian bank, the dollar then has to go f for a fraction of a second through New York, through what's called a dollar clearing bank, through the SWIFT system. And so the information also exists in New York. And there's no Gorbushka in New York, but um, if you've become the victim of a crime um, or there's a civil lawsuit going on, you can show up in a New York court and you can ask for a, something called the 1782 subpoena where you can ask Citibank or JP Morgan or Wells Fargo or one of the other big banks to hand over the information that will help you solve the crime. And so between Gorbushka and the 1782 subpoena, um, we were able to build a pretty interesting roadmap of where the money went from the $230 million that killed Sergei Magnitsky. Yeah. There was also a whistleblower, Pierre Pilici, who was murdered actually in, in Surrey in London, uh, of whom we always thought that he was one of the accomplices, uh, accomplices of uh, Berezovsky, one of the oligarchs. And there was this, this, yeah, this roadmap in New York. You started, what you told us, you started in New York, and there you also found these blocking institutions. First, you had to have a very good lawyer, which was this so-called man, John Moscow, Norman S. Omen, very interesting name. He was the one who put you on trail in the beginning. So, so, um, so yeah, I mean, so I needed a good lawyer to help me track the money. Um, and I found the, the, the very best money laundering former prosecutor in the world who had the unbelievably, unbelievable name, John Moscow. And John Moscow was the guy who said, on the first meeting, oh, you need to do a 1782 subpoena. And he then drew, drew up the subpoena request so it would be successful in court. Um, but then weirdly, uh, um, he, the guy was 
was a, a genius, but is also very sort of almost autistic or something. I mean, he's just a strange character. One day he just stopped returning my phone calls. And, um, and then I figured out the reason he stopped returning my phone calls was that his firm, it was called, a firm called Baker Hostetler, had, had just taken on the unwinding of the Madoff fraud. And they were being paid so much money unwinding the fraud that my small legal fees weren't interesting to him. And he stopped talking to me. And after a few years, it turned out to be that he was working for the Russians, from the, for the other party, with all the inf information you handed over to him. So, so it, it, it was remarkable. So this guy, John Moscow, um, helps us with the 1782 subpoena, helps us with our initial plans to find the money. We eventually find the money through, through all this stuff we've just described. Um, we, we take this information to the US Department of Justice um, they're amazed that we were able to find the money and the money went to New York and it bought the money bought $20 million worth of luxury apartments in Manhattan. And, and normally people don't show up with this type of package to the Department of Justice. And so they uh, went to court and they froze the assets. And, and their, their indictment was so damning, I couldn't imagine that anyone would ever show up to defend it because it was just like, you know, how, how can you defend it? And... Um, the, the, the judge froze the money, and then the next day, when I look at the docket, the court docket, this is the, the, like the piece of paper that tells you what's going on in court, and indeed the Russians had shown up to defend themselves, and who did they hire as their defense lawyer? None other than John Moscow. <laughs> it can only happen in America, I think. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's, it, it wasn't allowed in America ultimately. But but so he, so he goes from working for the victim of the crime, looking for the money, to then working for the alleged perpetrator of the crime. Um, uh, and 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 John Moscow. One of the big things he always said to me is, you know, this is a very dangerous business. These Russians are very very uh, violent people. You know, this is a, this is a big endeavor you're taking up. And then the first thing he did as the representative of the Russians is he issued a subpoena to me demanding to know all of my security details, all of my uh, travel details, um, all sorts of other information about my, uh, effectively about my personal safety, um, which law enforcement agencies I was talking to, which governments I was talking to, whistleblowers I was talking to. <clears throat> all the information that the Russian government would want to have to cause me harm. Yeah, but it also gave you the inspiration to write about these James Bond scenes of you <laughs> being in Colorado, being followed by his people who wanted to hand, hand over the indictment, etc., etc. And uh, it made for great fodder you, for a book. You've been very scared. <laughs> it's the, 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 the most the greatest part of the book, actually. Yes, it's true. But it's also, how is it possible? Because also when you wanted him to be removed from the case, you had to go to a federal court. And the president, the judge in this federal court was 83 years old or 87. And he actually didn't understand anything of the whole case. He didn't understand it was whom against whom. He didn't understand what you were trying to achieve. He only listened to John Moscow, more or less. So, so, there's, so the, 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 this is one of the things, I mean, you know, you, you kind of think that like the world should work the way the world should work, you know, that like, you know, the courts should be fair and defense lawyers should defend you and, uh, you know, governments should take care of their people and so on and so forth. And nothing works the way it's supposed to work. Um, in, in the U.S., there's no mandatory retirement age for judges. And so this judge um, was completely senile. <laughs> and and I, I think everybody in this room understands what I've just told you about John Moscow working for me and then switching sides. He, he couldn't figure, he didn't understand what was going on. And he, and he, and he said at the, in the hearing before ruling, I think it's kind of a mean thing to do to take a lawyer off a case. And, and, and rejected our, our um, application. And it's one of the Woody Allen scenes in the book, so, so w which I recommend deeply. How did it finally end? Moscow was removed. So we had- By chance? Well, we, had, we ended up literally for three years fighting with this, with, this guy was using every trick in the book to, to torture me legally. And um, we finally, <clears throat> 
we went to the Second Circuit, the appeals court, the, the court above the court that, that judge, the, this senile judge was operating in, and we presented it to this panel of judges, and they were appalled. I mean, they, they couldn't believe that this would have happened. And um, they did two things. They removed John Moscow and his partner and his law firm, and, um, and they ended up somehow engineering for this judge to somehow be put out to pasture. Um, but interestingly, and this is sort of an aside um, from the book, that even after being kicked off the case, John Moscow and his law firm, Baker Hostetler, they continued to secretly work for the Russians behind the scenes. Yeah. And, and when was the very moment when you discovered that not only these, these shell companies like Prevezon, uh, which bought his property in New York, was behind all this, and these police officers, I, I, I once met one of them in a huge apartment building in, in, in Moscow where a friend of mine lived, and he was driving a, a Daimler, a Daimler sports car, and I knew that the police major earns $15,000 a year, and the Daimler sports car costs $225,000. So I was asking, who is he? And my friend said, oh, he is one of the killers of Sergei Magnitsky. That's first the well-known information amongst those people. But when did you discover that they were all protected by Putin? Because his police officers got a medal from Putin when you were already proceeding against him. Well, so um, we, we discovered, so just before the, the um, or just after the Magnitsky Act was passed. 2012. Uh, 2012. Um, Putin basically declared at a national press conference that every single person who was accused was innocent. And um, at that point, you knew. We knew that, 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 that Putin was protecting them. And I mean, so it, it took me until about 2017 before I learned that Putin was a recipient of the money from this crime. Um, but, in, but, but in 2012, when Putin did that, he had basically become uh, involved at that moment in time when he announced as president of Russia that, that everybody was innocent, he was then participating in a conspiracy to cover up a murder. And that, that was the first moment that it became clear that, that Putin was like really up to his eyeballs in this thing. Yeah. The Magnitsky Act has also been adopted in the UK. But actually in the UK, the majority of the money went to it's based there. And actually the, the government of, of Prime Minister Johnson doesn't do anything about it against it, I should say. Well, so, so one of the things we did after the, and we, we, so we have found the money. We found where all the money went. And every time we find the money, we write a criminal complaint to the law enforcement authorities of that country. We found some here, by the way, and, and written yeah. to the Dutch authorities. And I say wrote about it. Um, and we found it in the United States, and as I mentioned, what happened there, in France, and in Switzerland, and Spain, and Poland, and Sweden, and all sorts of places. The most money from the Magnitsky case, from the $230 million, I went to the UK. And I live in London. And I went to the law enforcement authorities with a criminal complaint. And uh, I filed it. And at first I filed it with a serious fraud office. And they, and they said, you know, uh, uh, this is not the right authority to file it with, you know, sorry. I, then I filed it with the Metropolitan Police. And they said, uh, we don't have responsibility for these types of things. And then I filed it with a serious organized crime agency. And they said, sorry, this is not, not for us. And then I filed it with the HMRC, the, um, the tax authorities. They say, this is, uh, we can't comment on, non, on taxpayer matters. And, and then I filed it with the National Crime Agency. And uh, they said, this is not the, 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 we don't think that an investigation is the best way forward. It was like harder to get a, to get a, a money laundering case open in the UK than it is to get into Harvard law school. Um, are, are those people really as stupid as they seem to be? Or are they, are they bored? We know from the book of Catherine Belton that many people in high government offices are, are bored by the Kremlin. They have got huge uh, uh, salaries from being on the board of an oil company in Russia. Is it also because of that? Well, I, I don't know for sure, but what I do know is something really damning, which is that the last complaint that we filed, which, which was with the National Crime Agency, which is the Brit Britain's version of the FBI, if, if one could say anything is their version of the FBI. And um, I filed it with them, and the person I filed it with came to me about a year and a half afterwards, after he had quit the National Crime Agency. And he came to me as a private citizen. He said, can I invite you to lunch? So we went for lunch. 
And he said, I, I just want to tell you that, that I thought that there was a case, um, that the information you provided justified opening a, a criminal case. And I wanted to start pursuing a criminal case. And I was told in no uncertain terms by the most senior people in the National Crime Agency not to open a criminal case. And he tried to defy them and still do it, and he was told he'd be fired if he did. Okay, it's a pity Inspector Morse died. <laughs> yes, but um, finally, it was not in the last chapter of the book, it was not only about your $230 million. It turned out to be, thanks to your cooperation with some Danish investigating journalists, that it was about $240 billion being mo whitewashed, money laundered. Where did that money come from? Was it all from companies like Gazprom sold for... for how, how does it work, actually, the money laundering in Russia? Well, so what we discovered um, was the Magnitsky case, or the crime that Sergei Magnitsky discovered, which was $230 million, was one of a thousand similar scams and crimes. Each crime probably had a different attribute, mm -hmm. tax money, gas money, um, public procurement money, health money. All this money was basically not spent on the Russian people. It was spent, it was basically ferried out of the country. Yeah. It all went through one bank, Dansky Bank, and one branch of Dansky Bank, their Estonian branch. And um, th this probably will mean not much for most people in the room, but, um, for anyone here who has a little financial knowledge, you would think the, the CEO of Dansky Bank would have noticed that, um, that the Estonian branch was something like 200 times more profitable <laughs> per dollar of assets than any other branch in, in their system. <laughs> but apparently he just didn't notice. Um, so 232 billion is the number that was laundered through Dansky Bank. And this is just one bank. This is not Raiffeisen Bank. That's another bank where a lot of money was laundered. Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank you know, was another money. Maybe Raiffeisen Bank still active in Russia nowadays? Perhaps. Austrian. Yeah, Austrian. And so my feeling is that so we can prove 232 and we also know that the total amount of, of capital flight that's come out of Russia um, is about a trillion. And I believe that all the capital flight that's come out of Russia is effectively the same type of money that was laundered through Dansky Bank. Did this proof help you getting the Magnitsky Act adopted in Europe? Because this was 2017. The Act was adopted in Europe in 2020. No, it, it didn't help at all. The, 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 the person that helped get the Magnitsky Act passed in Europe is, is sitting Short, right there. Short Schwarzma. From right right there, Short Schwarzma. Goed gedaan, Short. And I think we'll talk about that in a moment um, yeah. uh, with him. Uh, it was only getting, getting Magnitsky Acts passed around the world. You, so how could it be a bad thing to, to freeze the assets of torturers, murderers, and kleptocrats? Sort of obvious, right? I mean, you know, that's sort of a no-brainer. Yeah. But where did this reluctance came from? It came from every government in the world. I mean, the United States did it first. It wasn't easy there. Mm. Canada did it second. It wasn't so easy there. Mm. UK did it third. And, and, and the European Union, it was almost impossible. Nobody wants to do it. Why? why? Because everybody wants to, wanted to continue doing business with Putin. Yeah. They all wanted, especially our, our own prime minister, uh, Mark Rutte. You criticized him in the TV show Boutinov two I'll weeks ago. I'd be happy to do so here tonight. Uh, <laughs> maybe he is uh, in the audience. <laughs> now, what did he do? Because we're, we're part, Holland is part of the, the gas road, as, it, as it is called. We are distributing Russian gas all over Europe. And that's the thing we were so glad of, uh, uh, having gained that concession in the past. Is that the main reason of, the, of this cabinet? I, I can't comment on what his reasoning was. All I can comment on mm -hmm. what his conduct was. And um, uh, starting in 2011, um, we got the parliament to call on the government unanimously to pass a Dutch Magnitsky Act. Mm -hmm. And um, nothing happened. 
and um, members of parliament continued to push on him and push on him and push on him. And um, I'll, I'll put some words in, into Short's mouth. He, he eventually went to Ruta and said, well, why, why don't you want to do this? And he said, we think it's, a, and, and this was after MH17, mind you. Mm -hmm. When a, in a moment when when no when he absolutely shouldn't have had any any sympathy for Russia at all, and he said, "Well, we think it's a good idea, but it would be so much better if it was done at a European level, not at the Dutch level." So I um, I then went to the European Union, to the European Commission, the External Action Service, and I said, "We'd like you to do a Magnitsky Act, please." They say, "But we think this is a great idea." but it should be done at a member state level. <laughs> and so this was when Shore and, and um, another member of parliament, Peter Omzicht, put together a resolution calling on the Dutch government to go to the European Union and present a Magnitsky Act. And if they fail within six months, to do it on a domestic basis. Yeah. Were there people inside the European Parliament who were fiercely against it? of whom you can think maybe they are also bought, they were also bought by uh, Russian government officials? There was the, the European Parliament was all for it, but there was one, one person who was fiercely against it, a person who was on the payroll of Vladimir Putin, and that is Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister of Hungary. And the really shocking dysfunction of the European Union is it allows every, every there's something called unanimity uh, it's, it requires all foreign policy decisions to require every member country to be unanimous in those decisions. And so what it means is that all Putin has to do is find one, pay off one person, and they can scupper the whole thing. And, and Viktor Orban of Hungary scuppered the Magnitsky Act right up until Alexei Navalny was poisoned. And at that point, it was just too hard to, to make an argument against it, and it went through. But the um, EU Magnitsky Act, they refused to put Sergei Magnitsky's name on the Magnitsky Act because they didn't want to upset Putin. Um, they refused to allow the Magnitsky Act to go after corrupt officials, only human rights violators. Mm -hmm. And to this day, even though every other country that has a Magnitsky Act has sanctioned the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky, the European Union has not sanctioned those people. How did the German government react? Because you, during dinner you told us that there still isn't a German publisher for the book. Has that got something to do with the historical sense of guilt of the Germans uh, towards uh, Russia? Yeah, let me just, let me, let me just uh, expand on that question for yeah. a second. So the book that I published, um, uh, I didn't know whether it worked or wouldn't work, but it's been a big success. It's the number one bestseller on the New York Times list, number one on the Globe and Mail list, number one in New Zealand, in Ireland, uh, number three in the UK, um, number one here. It was the number one book here last week, number one nonfiction book here. It's published in, I think, 18, it's going to be published in 18 languages. And to this day, I still cannot find a German publishing company to publish my book. Let's, let's go to the war. How do you think this will end? This whole system, this whole regime of Putin, this whole, it's a mafia system. <laughs> Putin has absolutely only one objective, which is to stay in power. That, that's all he wants, because if ever he's not to lose power, he loses money, he loses his freedom, and he probably dies. So for him, and I would, I would define Putin, if you, were to look, if you were to go to the physician's desk reference to look at you know, different types of ailments, his ailment is that he's a psychopath based on the definition of a physician's desk reference. He doesn't have any conscience. He has no sense of empathy. Um, uh, his heart doesn't start beating faster if he sees a child crying or somebody in grave pain. And so Putin is ready to do just about whatever he has to do to stay in power. So. And one of the things that Putin most dreads coming from his culture in Russia, he comes from a prison yard culture. And in a prison yard, you can't show any weakness. And so Putin cannot, now that he started this war, he can't show any weakness. Because if he shows weakness, he will lose his job. And if he loses his job, he'll die. 
So from, a, from his perspective, he has to constantly be escalating. Now, on the other side, um, the Ukrainians have found their voice, found their nation, found their righteousness, and ha had some success. And so they're not going to roll over and give away any territory either. And so there's three ways that this thing could end, or I should not, not, not end because not all three end. I mean, the first is that the Ukrainians could win this war. That's not a impossibility, that's a real possibility. The military hardware that we're giving them now, their motivation to win, to fight, they're defending their homeland, they're defending their freedom, they're defending their children, it's pretty strong motivation. And they have been winning in a lot of different places. Um, they could win entirely. And if they were to win, Putin would no longer be in power, and that would be the end of this terrible nightmare. But how, how can we help them? You told me, we were talking this afternoon about the oligarchs. We know the oligarchs of the 90s, they don't have got real power anymore, but they still have got lots of money. And we also know that half of their fortune is Putin's fortune. Correct. So what, what should we do against them? So squeeze we, them. So, so what, yes, <laughs> squeeze <Yeah>. them. <laughs> well, we so first of all, before we get to the oligarchs, we should supply every bit of military hardware that, that they ask for. There should be no reservation. And there should be no amount of money that we're, uh, that there, 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 there's no limit to the amount of money that we should spend on providing them with military hardware to fight off the Russians. Because if, if um, they don't do it, then we're gonna have to fight off the Russians eventually. And it's gonna be a lot cheaper in terms of lives lost if, if, if they succeed. And then the second thing we should do is we should make sure that Putin can no longer afford to, to fight this war. It's very expensive. It costs a billion dollars a day for him to fight this war. And at the moment, um, we have frozen about two thirds of the central bank reserves, which is excellent, 350 billion. And we've frozen 35 oligarchs, or I should say sanctioned 35 oligarchs out of 118 oligarchs. Um, and so we were sort of a third of the way in on the oligarchs, two thirds of the way in on the central bank reserves. And that's the savings of, or the savings that he can draw on. But he doesn't even need to, dr need to draw on his savings because at the moment, he's getting a billion dollars a day from the sale of oil and gas to us. And so he, he can carry on with this war financially, indefinitely, as long as we keep on paying him a billion dollars a day to kill Ukrainians. And he also, we also know that he needs Western technology and to, get, to get this oil out, out of so, the Siberian bottom. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that there's nobody supplying that technology. We need to make sure that we stop buying his oil and gas. We need to stop buying his oil and gas. And that's not gonna be easy, that's gonna be painful, that's gonna be expensive. But again, it's a lot more expensive to be at war with Russia, which is the, that, that's the other scenario. The other big scenario is that Putin somehow wins in Ukraine. Doesn't look likely right now, but that's possible. I mean, I've seen Putin fight, and whenever he looks like he's losing, he just does something more outrageous and more escalatory and more horrible. And I, that's what I've experienced in my own dealings with him. Yeah. And, if, and if he wins in Ukraine, he'll be at the Estonian border, he'll be at the Polish border, and he'll see whether we blink then. Yeah, because I was astonished to read in, in one of the Russian newspapers recently that actually his, the ideologues behind him, they don't think Article 5 of NATO will be active if and, he invades a, a Baltic country. And, and, and there's a probability that they're correct. I can, I can just picture that, he, that Vladimir Putin points a, a nuclear missile towards Washington, one towards London, one towards Berlin, and then points his conventional weapons towards Estonia. And then I can, I can just picture the um, CNN and Fox pundit saying, wait a second, are we ready to like lose 20 million people over a country that people can't find on a map? That, that, that is, that's what they, that, that's the, what the calculation that they're making. And, and that, that's an entirely possible 
scenario. And we absolutely don't ever want to face that. And so the best way of not facing that is to give the Ukrainians all the help that they, they need so that they hold him at bay. Yes, and we, and need, we need to do it fast because it's also possible that Donald Trump will become the next president of the United States. Well, so you never know. Th this, this is something, this is very important. So time is on his side, not on our side. So he, as long as he can avoid a coup, which I think he's pretty good at avoiding because he's done it so far for 22 years, we have democracies. And democracies are based on voters who are seeing the price of gas go up, the price of food go up, the price of heating go up, and who are some, in some cases losing their jobs to lower paid refugees. And this is a toxic brew for democracy where populism can come in and could be Donald Trump. I think if the French had had their elections a year later with these high prices, Marine Le Pen might have won. And anything could happen. And so time is on Putin's side on, on this thing. And so we have to do it fast. So coming back to the scenarios for a second, I would say there's a 15% chance that the um, Ukrainians win. And I think there's a 15% chance that somehow Putin um, ends up on the border of Estonia. And there's a 70% chance that this thing carries on and on and on when nobody wins. Um, and that's another really bad scenario because um, uh, the longer it goes on, the more we lose interest, the more the populism comes into dem democratic situations. Remember, we were all outraged about Syria. We don't even talk about Syria anymore. Assad is still there. He was, he's killed 500,000 people. You know, and Putin is, is banking, and, and he, he can hang on for a long time. Thank you. Bill Browder spoke with the Dutch journalist Michel Kielars about his book, Freezing Order, in May of 2022. Did you know that you can go to our website, john-adams.nl slash videos, where there's a link to the video of this extraordinary event. We also have a newsletter you can sign up for and a treasure trove of great American thinkers and speakers at john-adams.nl. While you're there, become a member of the John Adams. Not only do you support our events and our great speakers, you get a discount to the future live events. In the meantime, you should go to wherever you get your podcast and leave a review of this show. This will help get the word out. We get more listeners. We keep on sharing the very best of American thinkers with you free of charge. That's it for this week's show. Our theme song is called La Prensa by the Parlandos. Our editor is Tracy Metz. From Amsterdam, this was Bright Minds, a podcast from the John Adams Institute. I'm Jonathan Gruber. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.